I'm so blessed that you're taking a few moments to watch a message from Transforming Truth Online. Uh, I know it's going to be a blessing to you because anytime we open up God's Word, we're blessed. So my prayer for you is that you hear what's about to come forth, that it is mixed with faith so it'll be a profit to you. And I pray this. I pray that your soul expands. I pray that your spirit is strengthened. I pray that your eyes are enlightened. And I pray the Word of God does exactly what it's been doing for ever since it's been around. That is to draw us closer to the Son of God, who's Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's get into the Word. So let's look at 2 Kings chapter number 22. I'm going to read the first two verses, and then I want to introduce you to Josiah in his boyhood. The Bible says in 2 Kings 22 verse 1, Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jedidah, the daughter of Adiah of Bozkath. And Josiah did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and walked in the way of David his father. And he did not turn aside to the right or to the left. Those two verses have packed within them all sorts of glory for God and inspiration for us and instruction for how we live our lives. There's no way we come out of this series on the life of Josiah without soberly considering our influence to our children and grandchildren. That's going to be part of this. But what's amazing is, is, is well, you're going to find out Josiah's heritage was abysmal. It was horrible. His father and grandfather were, were treacherous men. And yet Josiah was able to come out of that and be, in the end, qualified as, as a king that never, there was no one like him before him or after him. God the Spirit sets apart Josiah and says this, look at him and learn from him. There's nobody like him. And so when the Holy Spirit says that about somebody in the Bible, we do well to say, okay, I want to learn. And so let's start off with that a little bit tonight. Let me give you some of the historical background. I know that sounds boring, but it won't be because Josiah's family history is pretty juicy stuff. So first of all, let's just start with a statement. The the boy was a wonder. He's a wonder boy. He is eight years old. The Bible says he's a third grader. He's eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned until he was 39 years old in Jerusalem. And then it mentions his mother's name who, uh, and his grandfather on his mother's side. Now, all of that is, is great. The, the, the thing I want to highlight there is that I, you've got to get this with me. He's eight, and he is placed upon the throne of God's covenant people, Israel. And he is ruling in the kingdom of Israel. He has all the authority. He's a third grader. Think about your kids when they were in third grade. Would you want to give them a throne to rule on? It's amazing to me. And yet, of course, this is just yet another example of God's ways being higher than our ways. But it's actually even more intense of of stunning that, that he's a third grader. You've got to understand a little bit about his family history. These were treacherous times for God's people. The northern part of the kingdom had already been carried away into captivity because of their idolatry, because of their immorality, because of their pagan polytheistic worship and their refusal to repent. They had already been carried away captive. They were destroyed. They were ransacked. And Judah was kind of, kind of holding their own, and, and God was giving them grace and space to repent and space to draw near. The great-grandfather of Josiah was a name you'll remember, Hezekiah. Hezekiah, a godly king a gloriously godly king who instituted both reformation and and was used to bring about revival to Israel. But that was the great grandfather of Josiah, and he had been dead a long time. What had happened in between was stark um, a contrast to Hezekiah and Josiah. Who am I talking about? First of all, Josiah's grandfather was a guy named Manasseh. The Bible says Manasseh, Josiah's grandfather, was the single most vile and wicked man ever to be king in Israel. And that is Josiah's grandfather. 
Now, let me just give you a little Bible on Manasseh. If you want to read more about it, you can write down 2 Kings 21. I'm going to read you a few verses from the way the Bible, the Holy Spirit wanted to describe Manasseh. Here's what he said. Manasseh was 12 years old when he became the king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 55 years. No king reigned longer than the most wicked king. The guy who reigned the longest in Israel was the most wicked one, and he did great devastation to the culture and to the religious um, setting in Israel. Israel. The Bible says he did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and it speaks as if he did evil in, in taunting God. He did it openly and blatantly and without shame and without hesitation. He openly lived evil before God. The Bible says that he followed the detestable practices of the nations that the Lord had driven out before the Israelites. He re rebuilt the high places that his father Hezekiah had destroyed. He also erected altars to Baal and made an Asherah pole, just like King Ahab had done. He, bound down, he bowed down to all the starry hosts and worshipped them. In other words, he worshipped the stars. He set up in the temple pornographic, they're called Asherah poles, they are phallic symbols, they are pornographic carvings. He set one up in the temple of God. He worshiped the host of heaven, the stars in the temple of God. He brought in altars, built an altar to Baal in the temple. He was literally shaking his fist in the face of the God of Israel, and he did it from age 12 all the way to age 67 years old. And every single decade, it got worse and worse and worse. But let me tell you what else he did. The Bible says that he sacrificed his own children in the fire. That means when they were worshiping one of the pagan gods, Molech or Chemosh, Part of that pagan worship was they would sacrifice their children. And what they had is they had an altar. And one of the altars that they would have was the, a carving representing this god Molech or Chemosh. And part of the carving was his lap, a big lap. And that lap had a tunnel that led down into a furnace. And they would heat that, that idol up, that furnace up, and they would toss their children onto the lap, and the child would be then f fall down into the furnace. That was their worship. That's what Manasseh erected in Israel. He was under, he was part of the people that were under covenant. They had all of the promises and all of the covenants and all of the blessing from Yahweh, and he said no to that. And his, his, his darkened heart was attracted to go after things like this. And he did it in the face of God. The Bible says in, in, um, also that uh, Manasseh practiced divination, sought omens, consulted mediums, and spiritists. So he was into the occult way in over his head. And then it just kind of sums it up in 2 Kings 21. It says, he did much evil in the eyes of the Lord, arousing his anger. Manasseh also shed much innocent blood that he filled Jerusalem from end to end. Now, I know you didn't come out to hear this stuff. This is not encouraging. This is not pleasant. But I'm trying to set the backdrop of Josiah's family. This is his grandpa. His great-grandpa, a godly man. Something happened between Hezekiah and Ammon. Ammon. Ammon came to the throne at 12 years old. Something in those 12 years... When Ammon took the throne at 12 years old, he disregarded everything he had seen his godly father Hezekiah did, and he entered in willfully into darkness. And darkness, when the leader is in darkness, darkness perpetuates in the land. Well, what about, what about Manasseh's son, Ammon? What about that? Well, let, let, let's look at this. Jo Josiah's daddy, Ammon or Ammon, 2 Chronicles 33, verse 22 says this, He did evil in the eyes of the Lord as his father Manasseh had done. Ammon worshipped and offered sacrifices to all the idols Manasseh had made. But unlike his father Manasseh, he did not humble himself before the Lord. Ammon increased his guilt. And then 2 Kings 21 says, Ammon forsook the Lord, the God of his ancestors, and did not walk in obedience to him. Right at the end of Manasseh's life, when God brought the hammer down in anger on Manasseh and brought great um, judgment on him, Manasseh humbled himself and repented. 
That's amazing because he had spent his whole life just propagating evil. But at the end of his life, when God brought discipline on Manasseh, Manasseh repented and God gave him grace. Amon was a witness to that. And Amon, when his father died, saw no benefit in perpetuating repentance. He made the evil that his father done the law of the land. Amon ruled for two years in Israel and was murdered. Josiah was a first grader when his daddy took the throne. And he was a third grader when some of his daddy's counterparts murdered him. That's Josiah's home life. Now let's just pause there for a minute. We live in a generation. Let me, let me just be reflective here and pastor all of us for a moment. We live in a generation where our culture freely hands us any excuse as to why we can live a life that is beneath the dignity of God. Our culture constantly says, well, this kid didn't have a chance. Look at his upbringing. Um, this kid didn't have a chance because his, his, his parents split up or divorced or grew, he grew up poor. He grew up on the wrong side of the tracks. Our culture says that we are slaves to our environment. It's very religious, by the way. Uh, it's funny, an, an agnostic, atheistic culture seems to believe in the God of fate very strongly. So in other words, if it was your fate to be brought up in unprofitable circumstances, then it's also your fate, your right to live as a loser, as a subpar individual. And so what's happened is our culture now affirms lives that are lived beneath what they could and simply just says, we can blame it on a whole host of things, the reason why this child didn't grow up to be a productive adult. And then we have these examples like Josiah, whose grandfather was the most powerful political figure in the land, and he sanctioned murder infanticide, homosexual, heterosexual idolatry, polytheistic worship, brutal murder, sacrifice, bloodshed, treachery. That was grandpa. And then when grandpa passed away, daddy had two years to do it, and he just upped it a notch from what grandpa did. And Josiah, his father's murdered, and all of a sudden, Josiah, Josiah, you're the new king of the land. So here's, here's the thought in all of this. What was it about Josiah that he didn't follow in his father's and his grandfather's footsteps? And do you know what the answer is? We don't know. Humanly speaking, on the horizontal, obviously God's grace and God's sovereignty and all of that. But listen, as sovereign as God is, God is not so sovereign that we don't make decisions about our direction in life. So somewhere along the line, there was a shift in Josiah's heart where he had to say, I will not be like my father. I will not be like my grandfather. I will live for Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I don't know what made that decision. The Bible doesn't give us any hint. The only thing we know about his mom is her name and her father's name. Now, you don't have to agree with this at all. I'm just going to be speculative for a minute. But my guess is that Mama somehow got a hold of Josiah and said, by the time he was six years old, don't be like your daddy. Don't be like your grandfather. And, and listen, we're, we're told his maternal grandfather's name, Adaya of Boscath. Boscath's kind of like a locust grove. I mean, it's a no-name city there in Israel. It's not a very popular kind of place if you're from Locust Grove. Forgive me, I didn't mean that. But it's just, it's kind of a podunk kind of area. But, but that's the only thing we know. The only two people we know that might have influenced young Josiah outside of his grandfather and, and father is his mother and his maternal grandfather. Somebody had to have gotten a hold of this boy in formative years and poured faith and truth and love and grace into him. It just reminds me of this. And maybe, maybe that's why the Holy Spirit had us bring up the girls this morning. I'm telling you, man, I could have done that all night long. I was just, I knew if I went down there, I would scare those little girls. So I just stayed up here. I just, I've learned. I've raised a daughter and I've been pastor it long enough. And I, I didn't want to go down and scare them. But man, I, I just felt like I wanted to prophesy over every one of them and speak life into them. Because of just sensing the volume of love that the Father has for them. And it's not just some sentimental love. It is a, a power love. That, that he's going to do something in their lives. 
And I realized, man, if we do not get that into them when they're two, four, six, eight, ten years old, by the time they're ten, if we aren't pouring that into them, somebody else will have poured something else into them. And so somebody got a hold of Josiah. I don't know who. So he's a third grader. Here's something else about Josiah. It's all the more remarkable. There was no Bible in the land. None. Nobody had a copy of the law. Nobody had a copy of David's songs. Nobody had a copy of any of the prophetic voices. Manasseh and Ammon had so brought the nation out of reverence, obedience, and the fear of the Lord that the Word of God, and they didn't have it like we have it. We, we've got copies everywhere of the Word of God. It would have been rare in that day, but, but it, it should have been central to who they are, but it was gone. It had been gone so long that nobody even noticed anymore. You're going to find that out in the series. So Josiah wasn't reading his Bible and the Holy Spirit hit him and he all of a sudden had a revelation about what he wanted to do because he read it in Scripture. It wasn't like that. So he, he didn't have godly examples from his father and his grandfather. There was decadence all throughout the land. The whole land was sin-soaked. I mean, they were about to get judged mightily. Judgment was coming. The northern tribes had already been judged. It was just a bl- they were in the grip of Satan as a nation. And Josiah gets on the throne as a third grader, and immediately, things started shifting. Things started moving. Things started turning. Because God had a yielded vessel on the throne in the form of an eight-year-old boy who had all the authority in the land. I, I, I think, well, let's, let's just go, let's go a little bit further. He started when he was eight, and he died on the battlefield when he was 39. He never got old. He did all of this as a young person. Let's look at a little bit. I'm going to give you an overview of some of the things that Josiah did. Because the boy was a wonder, but he didn't stay a boy. He grew up, and he became a king, and the king was a reformer. How many of you know the word reformation, and you know what that means in the context of the kingdom? Before I even get into the specifics, let me just go ahead and not take it for granted that we understand the concept of reformation. This is the way things work in people groups in a kingdom. It can happen in churches, it can happen in families, it can happen in our own heart, it can happen in nations. And you especially see it in the Old Testament, and you'll see it a lot in the book of Judges. But there's patterns that take place in the kingdom. God's people enter into some kind of covenant with God, and at the beginning, they're sincere, they're moved. They're deepened. They are uh, committed. They are full of joy. And whatever they're doing in that season, it is, it is beautiful. And God begins to bless, and He begins to bless, and He begins to bless. But something happens to the human heart in the context of blessings when they begin to be taken for granted. The people started consuming the blessings, and they started forgetting the blesser. So it became about life. It became about growing and prospering and doing and increasing. And then it became less about obeying and reverencing and worshiping and sacrificing. And and soon the things that were once so precious in their covenant with the Father now were, were diminished and set aside. And as you set aside that intimacy with the Lord, what happens is your heart can't, um, it can't continue in the same capacity that it once did. That, that's the beginning of all, we, we commonly refer to it as backsliding, call it whatever you want. But it all begins with tiny steps away from intimacy. You, you can still be serving. You can still be exercising your gifts. But you've moved away from the place of intimacy. You've moved away from the source of all the goodness that can be in your life. And so nations and churches and individuals and families do this. And what happens is time goes long and a generation comes after the next generation and the next generation. And suddenly maybe two or three generations go by and that nation or that family, uh, that family heritage are, are in a smaller context in our own hearts. Time goes by and we're nothing like we used to be. And so in the broad context, God raises up reformers. When, listen, 
When reformation is needed in the church, what God does is he'll take some unlikely, unsuspecting character and he'll start sharpening that woman or that man's discernment. And oftentimes it's a new believer that doesn't have any baggage on them. And they come into it and all they've got is their Bible and the Holy Spirit. And they're reading the Bible and they're looking around and they're like, my church isn't like this. My pastor is not like this. Our nation's not like this. And they start asking questions. They don't ask permission, they ask questions. They, say, they start saying, hey preacher, I, I, I appreciate that, I love you, but you, you know, our Bible says this, and how come our church doesn't do this? And all of a sudden, waves are being made. And a lot of times the establishment, religion, will do, it, they'll do everything to stifle that kind of voice in the church because they're, they're now bought into the status quo. They now want to preserve the status quo because the status quo is usually working for the guy in charge. It's, it's, he's, he's gaining from it. Are y'all still with me? I'm going somewhere with this. Be patient. I only got two verses. You know, I'm going to ramble a little bit. Those little questions start becoming declarations. Instead of saying, why, why isn't this right? The, that volume goes up. This isn't right. This is wrong. This is an affront to a holy God. We're not the people we pr pretend to be. Our Bible says this, but we live like this. We say we belong to the Lord who is a God of grace and peace and mercy and love and compassion, and yet we find ourselves segregated and prejudiced and uh, angry and hostile and divided. We say we're a people of the Word because we read a verse every Sunday and then... then, then the guy in charge just says whatever he wants to say. We say we're a people of the word, but how come we never talk about this in the word or this in the word or this in the word? And so all of this, this dissatisfaction starts bubbling up. That's where reformation starts, by the way. Reformation starts when God singles a person or a group of people and says, hey, I'm looking for people who don't want to put up with the nonsense anymore. Can I count on you? And the person says, yeah, Lord, I don't. I don't want to put up with the nonsense. God says, good, because I'm about to send you right into the midst of the status quo, and you're going to wreck it. You're going to turn it on its head. Now, reformers are always appreciated after they're dead. <laughs> but man, when they're in the midst of it, you know what? They're, they're, they're viewed as troublemakers, loudmouths. Who do they think they are? Well, let me just tell you, Josiah had the unique privilege of having a reformer's heart while he sat on the king's throne. So he not only had the discernment, he had the authority. And that's what makes his story so unique. He was unwilling to let things go on as they had been. And so when we see the king as a reformer, let me just start telling you a few of the things that he did. The first thing Josiah did, the Bible gives you little snapshots between eight years old and 18 years old. He started making changes, but his, he didn't really explode on the scene until he was around 20 to 26 years old. But even as a teenager, his heart started getting churned. And as he grew, he would walk throughout the land, still seeing the influence of Manasseh, his grandfather, and Amon, his father. And he's seeing pagan altars. He's seeing the pornographic symbols related to uh, the Asherah poles. And he's seeing these things and he's asking questions. Somebody had to have been helping to condition his thinking positively towards the Lord. There's probably some unsung hero in glory right now. Maybe it's his mom. Maybe it was his grandfather. We don't know. Maybe it was a mentor or a tutor. But there's some no-named person sitting in glory right now that was the primary influence on a young man's life that eventually it gives birth. It blossoms in to a sweeping reformation that changed the land. And we don't even know who the person is. So he's going through the land, and he starts seeing all these things, and the first thing he wants to do is he wants to rep repair and renew the place of worship. His, his first focus leaps upon the temple, and the temple for 75 years had been in complete disuse and disrepair, not to mention the defilement, because Manasseh had brought in... I mean, guys, I, I don't want to be cute, or and this isn't funny, but I'm telling you how... how scandalous it is for what Manasseh did in the temple. 
The, the equivalent of our day is if I put up on the big screens a, a, an X-rated movie on a Sunday morning. That's what was going on in the temple. And so Josiah's like, the first thing we got to do is we got to repair the temple. It had fallen into physical disrepair. It had fallen into spiritual uh, defilement. And so as a young man, he starts saying, and he's, he's, he's learned about the temple, and the temple's for Yahweh, and the temple's for sacrifice, and the temple is for worship, and the temple is for prayer, and the temple is for praise, and they don't do any of that. And so his young heart starts saying, yeah, that, that's not right. And I'm the king, and I'm going to make it right. Just as a young boy, as a teenager, with no copy of the scriptures, remember, he's got no Bible. He doesn't have the Bible telling him what to do. All he's got is a yielded heart and a vision for a God that has never been taught him didactically. He's had to learn everything by limited tradition and oral tradition and people that would tell him, but he doesn't have a Bible. But he's got the heart yielded to God, and and a heart yielded to God can do amazing things. And so the Holy Spirit is working in him, and with no copy of the Scriptures, Josiah begins to cleanse the land of pagan influences. Okay, he's around 20 years old now, and he's now, he's he's an adult, he's a man, he's been the king for 12 years. He's not only got the positional authority, but he's also now, he's got the prowess. He, he, He looks like a man. And so he's walking throughout, the Bible uses a phrase in the old King James that I'll never forget. It says, Josiah turned himself and spied out the land. So he's not just casually saying, you know, just kind of meandering. He's literally walking up and down the land, and he's saying, is that for Baal? Is that for Molech? Is that an Asherah pole on that hill? I want you to go up there, and I want you to destroy all of that. And if you see any pagan priest, I want you to bring them down here because we're going to deal with them. And he starts getting hardcore. Now, let me tell you something. Here's what we don't get. When you start bringing your faith into a culture that has been conditioned to hate your faith, you're going to get some pushback. He's not just making new rules. He is upsetting the apple cart big time. People's lives are going to get jacked up because Josiah is saying, we're not doing this in the land anymore. That's illegal. That's ungodly. And so people that were profiteering off of it, I mean, they, they had prostitutes that worked in their temples. And their, their places of worship in the groves. They have people that made their money off the sensual practice. Okay, let's worship this God. And one of the ways that we worship this God is we engage in fornication. And at the end of the fornication, please put your tithe in the offering plate. And that's how they made their money. And so Josiah is outlining all that. And so people's lives are getting turned upside down. If you ever wonder what your pastors mean, and I've heard this from Dustin, myself, Billy, Gabe. Oh, listen, when we're saying it's going to get messy around here, that's the kind of stuff that we're talking about. We're talking about the status quo is gone. If, if, if you're addicted to the status quo, it's a good time for you to get into rehab right now. Because listen, the status quo is gone. Why? Because we want revival. And the thing that precedes revival is reformation and repentance. And so it's not like we're going to be walking up and down the aisles and hawking over people or hiding in the shrubs outside of your house saying, aha, that's not the spirit I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is us policing our own hearts. God be merciful unto me, the sinner. Lord, examine me. See if there be any wicked way in me. So we're dealing with the beam in our own eye before we start pointing around at the specks in other people's eyes. And when you start getting radical about holiness, radical about worship, and radical about intimacy, and radical about intercession, and yes, I'm using the word radical. Why? Because the the blight, the cancer on the church in America, especially in the Bible Belt, is that radical is a bad word in the church. You know what we replaced radical with? balanced. That's, that's actually, I'm saying, hey, it's a really balanced church. Man, look at the ministry of the Son of God. That look balanced to you? Eat my flesh and drink my blood. Is that a balanced sermon? Pick up your cross and follow me. If you don't do that, you can't be my disciple. Does that sound radical or balanced? You look at the book of Revelation and you see what's coming. Not only the apocalypse and the wrath of God being poured out on planet Earth, which is not balanced, but when the kingdom comes 
and the marriage supper of the Lamb, and the judgment seat of Christ, and the rewards being poured out, and then the new heavens and the new earth, it's not balanced. It's way out of balance good. And yet we have somehow bought into the post-enlightenment of mild is better. I hate mild salsa. I do, man. I had Mexican food for lunch today. And I, I was literally looking in the bowl of salsa and saying, where are the jalapenos? Me gustan mucho jalapenos. Quiero más. Why? That's just, man, I just think it's, it ought to be in us. Now, I'm not talking primarily about, I'm getting hungry, um, about, about Mexican food. I'm, I'm just saying, um, Jesus didn't come and do all that he did so that we could be mild. It's just not him. That is a cultural nuance that has been injected into the meat of the church. And that meat's gone bad. Josiah in the series is going to be used by God to stir some of our hearts. And so it's this 20-year-old guy. Guys in their early 20s are, are known for their lust. They're known for their out-of-control desire for female conquests. Not Josiah. Josiah is walking around the land disgusted at the sexual immorality in the land. God had such a hold on this young man's heart that he's saying, I want it gone. It's an affront to a holy God, and it's a, it's a provocation to my soul. I want it gone. And he did it. He did it. So at age 26, they're still working on the temple, and Josiah is 26, and they found the greatest treasure that Israel could find at that time. They found the scriptures. Literally, the scriptures had been lost in the house of God. Wow. They were building, some, some, literally some construction workers found the scrolls, and nobody knew what they were. The high priest is a guy named Hilkiah, and Hilkiah is working with kind of an administrator named Shaphan, and so Hilkiah goes on to check up at the work at the temple, and Shaphan's saying, here's what we're doing. Here's what we got done this week. It's looking good. Project's looking good. Go back and tell the king. And then Shaphan says, oh, by the way, uh, some of the dudes found this, this book over here, this scroll. And Hilkiah looks at it and he's like, oh, okay. No, actually, Hilkiah finds it, and he, he gives it to Shaphan. And so Shaphan's now got it, and he goes back down to the king, and Shaphan reads the thing, but he doesn't know what it is. So Shaphan's part of the king's administration. He's a leader in the land. He has no idea what the scriptures are. That's how long they had been gone. So Shaphan comes back and gives the report to Josiah. Josiah's 26 years old. He's doing reformation in the kingdom, all without the word of God. He's just going on whatever God's showing his heart. And then, then Shaphan says, oh, by the way, uh, here's a book. They found it in the temple. And Josiah says, will you read it to me? And as 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 the scrolls are being read. It's, it's the law. It's some part of the Old Testament. Josiah gets hit with Holy Spirit conviction that brings him to his knees just by hearing the Word of God. Just by hearing the Word. Matter of fact, he takes his royal robe and he rends it and he cries out unto God. This is when the real Reformation begins. Up to this point, it was the young boy who was an adolescent, who was a young man, and now at 26 years old, he's doing the best that he can. He's, he's just working off what he had, which wasn't much. And now God says, I can now trust him with the scriptures. His father and grandfather made sure those scriptures were buried and forgotten about. The last time they were seen, it was with his great-grandfather, Hezekiah. So two generations, no Bible. And it's delivered unto Josiah and he goes ape. I mean, he just loses it because as he's reading the words, most, most scholars believe it had to have contained part of Deuteronomy where, where the provisions of blessing and curse are listed out around Deuteronomy 28 because Josiah, when he hears it, he says, we are ruined. The wrath of God is upon our nation. Now, let, let me just give you a little bit on this. Um, it's really important for at least me, I know it is for 
the other three men that are going to help lead this. We're all working together. And I, I want you to hear me on this, and I don't want it to come to you and be received by you as, as some cliche, some church cliche. I want you to know it's rocket fuel in my spirit. We believe the Bible. We will preach and teach the Bible. When you show up, I, I'm, you can applaud if you want, but I mean, I, I, I feel silly because you go back 100 years in churches in America and a guy says that and they're like, well, what else would we do? But that's not the case anymore. Friends, we're, we're going to teach. What I'm doing tonight and what I'm, I do every time I get up here, I teach the scriptures. Do you know why? Because I'm going to be dead and gone one day and if you're living off of what I'm giving you, then you're going to die when I die. But if you will eat the scriptures and love the scriptures and believe the scriptures and obey the scriptures and share the scriptures, it's going to be juice in you, man. It's going to be vitality in you. And so whether it's Billy or I, and we'll do most of the preaching here, you're going to get the word of God. You say, well, Jeff, what about the rhema word? What about the prophetic word? I love that too. But brothers and sisters, if your spiritual diet is just prophetic word after prophetic word after prophetic word, then you are malnourished. You're living for prophetic words. And listen, I'm going to be very bold here. Maybe it doesn't apply to anybody in the room, but we'll say it for the sake of those who listen on podcast, okay? <laughs> Most people don't like teaching because they are lazy. They're like, man, I don't go through the scriptures again. We're doing 20 verses today. Come on, man, let's rock and roll. Give us some prophetic stuff. Um, and I, I just want to say this, Christians are lazy. We're lazy. When, when we look back historically and we see what, what people did to get a copy of God's word into our language and into our hands, you read about teenagers that were tied to the stake on the shore of the ocean, along with their mother and their father and their siblings, tied to a stake so that when the tides came in, they slowly drowned, all because they wouldn't recant their faith and they would not swear allegiance to something other than the God of the Bible. And those that printed the scriptures and the reformers that said, we cannot leave the scriptures in the hands of the clergy who lie and manipulate us through the scriptures, they're in teaching of the scriptures. We need to get the scriptures into the hands of the people. And people died, suffered, were tortured so that we might have a copy of God's word. And here we are, centuries later, and we have a different attitude about it. You see, when Josiah found the Bible, when it was brought to him, revelation came. See, we can't even recognize real revelation until we're at least somewhat familiar with the written revelation. If you're not, if you're, listen, I know this is not crank your truck kind of preaching right now, but I, I, I'm, I'm, just, I'm, I'm laying some foundational stones about what to expect. Some have asked, are, are we going to be more prophetic or more biblical? As if they come from the two different places? Um, when we gather on Sundays and on Wednesdays, 45 minutes to 55 minutes of teaching. Neither Billy or I will bore you. This is about a bore, as boring as it gets right here tonight. This is about as boring as it gets. Um, but the, I think one of the greatest sins a pastor or a preacher can do is, is to make the Bible boring because it's a book that's alive. It's a book that's alive. It's a book that's relevant. It's a book that will transform your life. And so Josiah gets a copy of it, and all heaven starts to break loose on his soul. So now, armed with God's word, what did Josiah do? He didn't just have like nine Bible studies. He reoriented the entire culture to get aligned with God's word. In true reformation... There will always be the centrality of the person of Christ and the Word of God. That is when true reformation, where, where we get off kilter is where we, we leave off from the Word of God and we, quit, we qu quit setting our affection on things above where Christ sits at the right hand of God. We get our focus off of Jesus and we, and we diminish the need for the Scriptures. And Josiah 
had the reverse effect. He now has the scriptures, so he's going out in the land, and he's literally making phase two. It's like Reformation 3.0. I mean, he's going after it. And we'll read about that. I'll show you all the stuff that he did. But the the thing that that amazes me is he did more without the Bible than most of us are doing with the Bible. Now, I don't want to be critical. I'm not even really talking about you, so to speak. I'm just talking about the church, Christendom. And he's just going after it. Josiah ended up making uh, loyalty to Yahweh, (laughs) the firm law in Israel, And he brought the entire nation to come and hear the word of God be read. And then he called every single one of them into national covenant. They renewed their vows to God as a nation. All right, help me with faith here, Jesus, please. Could you imagine if we had leadership like that in our land? I'm I'm going to confess something. I can't even conceive of that ever happening again. I want faith to believe it. But can you, can you actually envision what would happen if we had a man or a woman of God leading this nation? Not, not during election season where they need to get the conservative Christian vote. I'm talking about somebody who is just... My flesh says a guy or a gal like that can never get elected in this country. Josiah, they never saw him coming. They never saw Jed. Let's not tell God what he can and can't do. I'm preaching to me right now. Let's not tell God that that will never happen. Sometimes all he doesn't need a new person. He just needs to get a hold of the heart of the person that's already in the Oval Office. And that's why we're commanded to pray for our leaders. But I digress into political arena, and I shall not. Let me finish up. I know what time it is. So Josiah does something, because up to this point, it's all tearing down. It's all kind of heavy. It's all kind of negative. Okay, I get that, but that's part of Reformation. The first phase of Reformation is you've got to tear down strongholds. You, you, You have to topple them. Study it out in the scripture, study it out in history. You're going to find that one of the primary, the initial visible effects of Reformation is the tearing down of sinful practices and strongholds. So Josiah does that and really upsets the all apple cart, but he's the dude on the throne, so he doesn't have to ask permission. He calls everybody in the national covenant, and then he does something that hadn't, hadn't happened in probably 70 years. He institutes the celebration of Passover, the primary feast and celebration of the Jewish people. They didn't even know what it was anymore. But he had the Bible. And he could read the instructions, and he saw the dates, and he saw what to do, and he saw what they not to do. And he was able to empower people to instruct the families and the family. And the Bible says that Josiah's Passover was uh, incomparable to any other Passover that ever took place. Because the people had missed it for so long, and now God was being centralized in the national life of Israel, and that Passover came with spiritual enlightenment and celebration and power. I'll just give you this. It is often intimidating to, to people, or maybe you yourself, or somebody you love, or a church, the hard work of Reformation Tearing down what is wrong, changing things, biting the bullet, taking the shrapnel as leaders for when you say, in the name of Jesus, we're going to do it his way. And and people leave and they say stuff about you, man. And you just learn to kind of take the shrapnel. But the reason why you take it is because on the back end, there's a celebration that you never could have had had you not initiated Reformation. The Bible says that Jesus endured the cross and despised the shame. Why? For the joy set before him. The joy on the horizon motivated Jesus to deal with drinking the cup of wrath, the scorn and the shame and the rejection of vile sinners, the betrayal of Judas, the abandonment of his, of his other 11 friends. Jesus, for it was because of what the good that would come. And brothers and sisters, I, I just call us, I'm just feeling like a, kind of a holy moment here. 
if, if, if you and I will covenant with the Lord to pay the price because we're convinced that on the back end of it, there is such an intimacy and a goodness and a celebration that he has for us. If we will trust him enough for the good that comes, trust him enough to walk through the bad that we have to get through, then let's do that.